Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be going over more NCLEX topics that are important to know. These are subjects that um, you need to know for NCLEX. And so the way I uh, wrote this Kahoot, I wrote it as you are the nurse. So I'm not saying a nurse, no, you, you are the nurse. What are you going to do? Before we get started, guys, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel by uh, liking this video, subscribing to this channel if you haven't done so already, and also pressing that red notification button so you'll be notified every single time a new video is released. Don't forget, I'm now offering next generation NCLEX reviews. You can book on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. If you're a current student, you're not studying for boards yet, but you're really struggling in class and you really need to do well on your next exam, I got you also. You can get, grab yourself an audio lesson from my website, again, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And almost daily, you guys can find me covering a variety of nursing topics on my other social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. Without any further ado, guys, let's get started. NCLEX concepts. Your patient was in a motor vehicle accident and has a head injury. Subdermal hematoma is suspected. Which medication order would you question? Promethazine, morphine sulfate, docusate sodium, or ranitidine? <laughs> Interesting. Most of you guys chose docusate sodium. So let's talk about this situation and why you just killed your patient. You and your doctor. All right. So your patient just got in a car accident. We suspect that they have a subdermal hematoma, right? We don't know, but we suspect. What medication would you question? Whenever you get a test question that says, which medication would you question? Which medication would you clarify? What they're really asking you is, which one is the wrong one? That's why you're questioning it. That's why you're clarifying it. So a patient who has something going on with their head, neurologically speaking, right? We're going to be concerned about increased intracranial pressure, and we're going to do everything that we can to make sure we decrease the intracranial pressure. We suspect that they have a subdermal hematoma. So let's look at the choices. Promethazine, Phenergan, we're not going to question that. We expect antiemetics to possibly be ordered. Why? Because if the patient's vomiting, it's going to increase their intracranial pressure. We don't want their intracranial pressure to be increased. So we're not going to question that. Docusate sodium, that's a, that's a stool softener. We expect that to possibly be ordered. Why? We don't want our patients straining to have a bowel movement. Why? Straining also increases intracranial pressure. Ranitidine, that is a PPI. That's an anti-ulcer medication. There's no contraindication to that. And you know, if the patients, they're in the hospital, they got a suspected subdermal hematoma, they may be on an NG2 for decompression, whatever it is, we don't want them to get an ulcer. There's nothing wrong with that patient getting a PPI. But morphine sulfate, morphine sulfate, that is an opioid. What do we know about this type of analgesic? It decreases respirations, that's number one, but it also decreases what? CNS. Patients already got a problem with the CNS. We, you think we need that to be decreased anymore? Absolutely not. So that morphine sulfate, that is what you would question. You would not give that medication blindly just because the doctor ordered it. Because let me tell you something, the doctor and the healthcare professionals, they will throw you under the bus in a minute. You don't give something just because it's ordered. It has to make sense. And you better question it if it doesn't make sense. Second question, you're the nurse responsible for returning phone calls. Which patient are you going to call back first? Is it your first uh, trimester pregnancy complaining of heartburn? Is it a man with um, heartburn, uh, heartburn that's radiating to the jaw? Is it a wom woman complaining of hot flashes and insomnia? Or is it a girl complaining of knee pain after soccer? Who are you going to call first?
Very good. Most of you guys got this correct. Man complaining of heartburn uh, radiating to where? The jaw. What are you suspecting? You're suspecting the patient's having a heart attack. They're having a myocardial infarction. So that um, pain that they're feeling, most likely they're having an MI. And so that's who you're going to call first. Whenever you get a test question asking you who you're going to call first, who you're going to assess first, who um, is going to be your immediate priority. They're really asking you who's most likely to die first, who's in the most danger. That's who you need to see first. So it's going to be the person with the um, heartburn or chest pain radiating to the jaw or the arm, because we know that's a symptom of heart attack. If your female patient has a diagnosis of lupus and tells you she's thinking of getting pregnant. What is going to be your best response to this? Should it be, you should do it within the first eight months of diagnosis. Because of your diagnosis, gestation time will be slightly extended. How long have you been in remission? Or uh, most women find that pregnancy makes them feel better. What's going to be your response? Good. How long have you been in remission? And this is important because... Um, it's not recommended if a woman is has lupus. Um, it's actually recommended for her to be in remission from any acute attacks for at least five months before getting pregnant. So the first thing you want to do is actually get information. Ask her, okay, how long have you been in remission? And from that answer, then you'll know what your further either follow-up question is going to be or your discussion and education with that patient will be. The unlicensed assistive personnel tells you that your first day post-op patient is refusing to eat because she's not feeling well. Which action would be best? Have the UAP encourage the patient to take small bites. Call the healthcare professional for an order for pain medicine. Check the patient's chart for the latest vital signs in labs or talk to the patient about how they're feeling. That's right. Talk to the patient about how they're feeling. And I'm so happy you guys did not fall for the trick that I put in there, which was check the patient's chart. Let me tell you something. Patient before paperwork, every single day of the week, whenever you have somebody come to you and tells you something going on with your patient, you never send that back to your patient. You go to your patient, you assess your patient, you ask your patient questions. Now, after you talk to your patient, you ask them how they're feeling and you know, while you're talking to them, you're assessing them, you're doing, you're looking at them, you're doing a physical examination on your patient. Now, after you talk to them and you get information, by all means, go into the chart, look to see what the latest labs are, get more information. But the first thing you're going to do whenever somebody comes and tells you something's wrong with your patient, you go back to your patient immediately and you assess them yourself. Your pediatric patient has a leg fracture and it's in traction. You note that the leg is externally rotated. What's going to be your next action? Are you going to teach them to keep the leg in a neutral position? Are you going to adduct the leg? Are you going to apply a trochanter leg to the outer thigh? Or are you going to perform range of motion exercises on the affected leg? All right, very good. Most of you guys chose the correct answer, which is apply a trochanter roll on the outer th on the outer thigh. That's the correct answer. Someone on my live just said that this answer choice is leaving the patient alone. How is it leaving them alone if you're right there putting the roll on their thigh? So let's talk about this. That leg's broken. You can't do one. You see one? Teach them to keep their leg in a neutral position. They can't control that. The leg's broken. They're, so you can't teach them that the leg is broken. They can't forcibly make their leg stay in the neutral position. They can't do it. Two adduct the leg as it put those legs together. Absolutely not. That is contraindicated. That leg is fractured. Okay. You want to keep it in a neutral position 
ab with a b abducted not adducted and look at the green answer perform range of motion exercises are you serious on the broken leg? Are you trying to worsen that patient's condition? Are you trying to lose your license? Absolutely not. What you want to do, because you want to keep that leg in a neutral position, and you know they have no control over it, they can't help it that's external rotated, what you're going to do is this uh, answer. You're going to put a trochanter roll on the outer thigh to force that leg to be in a straight neutral position. And while you're doing it, you can explain to the patient, hey, I'm doing it because of X, Y, Z, but you can't tell them to do it because they can't do it themselves. You have to do it for them. So that's why that's the correct answer choice. Your pediatric patients need surgery and both parents have legal joint custody. One parent signs the consent. What do you do next? Do you notify the healthcare provider, inform the surgical team, contact the other parent to sign the consent or continue with the pre-op preparations? By the way, guys, I love the comments in the live because that's what lets me know what you're thinking so I can either correct it or tell you're doing a great job. So keep it going, guys. That's right. Continue with the pre-op uh, preparations because guess what? You only need one signature. If they want to fight, let them fight. Let them go to court. Let them do whatever they need to do. But you only need one parental signature to do surgery for your patient. Very good. You're working on the neurology floor and you note that your patient has developed fixed and dilated pupils. What is going to be your next action? Are you going to elevate the head of the bed and reassess the patient in five minutes? Are you going to assess the patient's visual acuity using a Snellen chart? Are you going to lower the head of the bed and reassess the patient in five minutes? Or are you going to contact the healthcare provider? You're going to call tech, contact the healthcare provider. Everything else, you just help kill your patient a lot faster. Let me tell you something. Um, fixed and dilated pupils, this is a neurological emergency. And I always say to you, be ever, before you ever choose the answer, call the doctor, look at your other choice to see if there's anything you can do to save your patient. None of these are choices to save your patients. All of these are choices to delay your patient getting help. You remember that viral video of that gentleman that was working at the hotel and the Karen was calling him all these racial slurs and she was getting kicked out of the hotel and she tried to apologize and he said, it's above me now. That's the situation you're in. Okay. If your patient's pupils are fixed and dilated, you as a nurse, it's above you now. It's between the, the healthcare provider, the surgical team and God, there's nothing else that you can do for that patient. So you're going to call the healthcare provider. You're caring for an adolescent patient and he confides in you that his girlfriend just got a diagnosis of hepatitis B. What should be your initial response? You must have been shocked. You need to be tested right away. You should be vaccinated. Have you had unprotected sex with her? Very good. Have you had unprotected sex with her? So yes, you can talk to the patient about being checked. Yes, you can talk to the patient about being vaccinated. But the first thing you need to do is assess, get information. Let me tell you something, guys. When it comes to NCLEX, most of your questions are going to be based on these three things. ABC, airway, breathing, circulation. The nursing process, assessment, diagnosis, planning, intervention, evaluation, and Maslow's hierarchy of needs, physiological integrity being first. So the first thing you're going to do is get information. Have you had unprotected sex? That needs to be the initial response before any teaching or education can be provided. What's the best way to teach a four-year-old about an upcoming surgical procedure? Is it by explaining through a drawing, describing the amount of time the procedure will take, using dolls or puppets to explain the procedure, 
or reading an age-appropriate coloring book about the procedure to the patient. All right, very good. It's a four-year-old, so this is a preschool age child. So the best thing is to use dolls or puppets. And um, remember, children this age, they learn through 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 play and inanimate objects. And so while you're teaching them, it also decreases their anxiety because this doll or puppet is something that they're able to touch. And so you can show them this is where the surgery is going to be performed, and you can. Uh, um, play it out on that doll or puppet. Explaining through a drawing, that is for an older child or an adolescent. Describing the amount of time the procedure will take, that tells you nothing about the upcoming procedure itself. And um, reading an age-appropriate coloring book about the procedure, that would be for a school-age child, but because the child's four years old, they are preschool, dolls and puppets would be the best choice. As a nurse, which situation would you assess first? A patient threatening to sue the facility for falling out of bed? The practical nurse showing up late to work for the third time this week? The healthcare provider on the phone waiting for serum and electrolyte results from the lab? Or the wife of a patient reporting that the patient's nose started bleeding after chemotherapy? Very good. You always address physiological integrity first. What will kill or harm your patient? That's what needs to be addressed first. You see this? I just put that in a tricky. Who, not who cares, but at the end of the day, the doctor can wait. Nothing's wrong with them. You're concerned about your patient. Physiologically speaking, that patient bleeding, that's going to be a priority. You need to go assess that patient first. Your patient is in sickle cell crisis. What should be your immediate action? Should it be to give them oxygen? Should you turn them to their right side? Should you give them fluids? Or should you give them antibiotics? If you could only choose one, what's it going to be? Hmm. You guys are doing the most with me right now. All right, let's talk about this. Let's talk about the pathology of sickle cell. So you can understand why giving fluids is the correct answer choice. When a patient's in sickle cell crisis, here's what's happening, right? Those RBCs, which are supposed to be nice, and round. And that's what keeps the blood flowing through the vessels, right? Because they're nice and round. When the patient's going through a crisis, those uh, uh, RBCs, which are supposed to be nice and round to make the blood flow, they now become sickle. They come be like a half moon, right? And so they start to clump together. They clump together. And instead of flowing nicely, they're like flowing, flowing very slowly because they're all clumped together. Guess what fluids does? The minute you give them fluids, those cells that were all sickled, that were all clumped up, they become nice and round again, and it allows the blood to flow freely again. I want you to think about this. Let, let's just think about this, and it's going to make sense to you. RBCs carry hemoglobin, right? Right. Hemoglobin carries oxygen, right? Right. The patient doesn't have a problem with oxygen. The oxygen is in the hemoglobin that's being carried in the blood. What they have a problem with is that oxygen that's carried in the hemoglobin, that's carrying the blood, getting to where it needs to go because the cells are all sickled. But once they become unsickled, the oxygen goes where it needs to go. The patient doesn't have a problem with oxygen. What they have a problem with is those cells being sickled. And that oxygen is not going to make those cells become unsickled as fast as the fluid does. Do you see what I'm saying? The problem in sickle cell crisis is not oxygen. They have oxygen. The oxygen's in the hemoglobin. The problem is the oxygen's not moving because the RBCs are sickled. But the minute you give that patient fluids, oh my gosh, those RBCs that were sickled all of a sudden become nice and round and the oxygen starts flowing again the way it was supposed to. Don't say I didn't warn you. 
which would be the most appropriate goal for a patient with Parkinson's disease? Is it to stop the progression of the disease, to assist the patient in obtaining a dignified death, to maintain optimal function of ADLs and range of motion, or to assist the patient to prior ADLs and range of motion? Oh, you guys are great. Okay, you're back to, you're back with me because I was worried about you guys for a minute. Very good. We want to obtain optimal function of ADLs and uh, range of motion. Here's the thing. Parkinson's is a progressive disorder. That means as time goes on, it only is going to get worse. So there's no stopping the progression. There's no reversing the progression. So what you can do is have increased, have the quality of life the best as possible by maintaining, by holding up the best functioning that they can. Okay. Look at, I'm so happy nobody chose assist in obtaining a dignified death. We are not nurse murder over here. We're trying to have the patient live and we're trying to have them live the best quality of life that they can. Remember, um, Parkinson's is progressive. Something else you guys got to remember about Parkinson's. Parkinson's is due to severe lack of what? Dopamine. Which medicine would be expected for a hemophilic patient that has a left knee injury that's painful, swollen and bruised would it be oxycodone ibuprofen aspirin or codeine what do you expect to be ordered for this type of patient that's right we don't want to be nurse murder mm -mm. Wow. So let's talk about this, guys. It's going to be codeine. The patient is hemophilic, so they're already at risk for bruising, a big time, right? So we don't want to give them anything that has anticoagulant properties. We don't want to give them anything that has bleeding properties. Oxycodone has aspirin in it. Ibuprofen has bleeding properties. It can make you bleed. You take too much of it. Aspirin can make you bleed. So we expect coding to be given out of all these medications because this patient's already at risk for bleeding and we don't want to make it worse. You're the charge nurse for three registered nurses, two licensed practical nurses, and one unlicensed assistive personnel. Which patient would you assign to the unlicensed assistive personnel? Would it be a Parkinson's patient that needs assistance with feeding? A patient with osteoporosis that reports dysuria and urgency? A one-day post-op patient with a tube feeding? Or a cancer patient that requires chemotherapy? Who would you give to the UAP? Very good. The patient that has Parkinson's that needs assistance with feeding. There's nothing wrong with that, right? The UAPs, they can feed the patients. They can help with the ADLs. They can ambulate the patients, but they can't give medications. They can't teach. They can't assess. Those are nursing responsibilities. So that's why you wouldn't give any of these choices, but they absolutely can feed the patient. You're caring for a sexual assault victim. What is your initial priority? Is it to encourage the patient to verbalize their feelings, to assess the patient for trauma or injury, to allow for privacy during the interview, or to assist the patient to contact family and or support systems? Very good, assessing for physical trauma or injury. Our priority is keeping the patient alive and safe, 
Okay. After we assess them for maybe they've got internal hemorrhage. We don't know until we assess them. After we assess them, we can care about everything else. But guys, whenever you're being questioned, or maybe you're between two choices, always say to yourself, what keeps my patient alive? Which one keeps them safe? That's always going to be your priority. All right. Last question. You're working as a triage nurse in the emergency room. Which patient should you see first? Is it a 10-year-old with a right foot injury from, from a rusty nail? Is it a 15-year-old with a fever, 102 degree temperature, and they're awake, alert, and oriented to place and time only? Is it an adolescent patient with a leg left leg fracture complaining of pain? Or is it a geriatric patient with flushed face, dry mucous membranes, and glucose of 470? <laughs> nope. Most of you guys chose that glucose of 470. That's who you'd see next. Your first uh, priority is going to be that adolescent, the 15 year old that has a fever and they're only awake and alert to place it in time only. Okay. The fact that they're an adolescent and there's a fever, one of the first things that need to come to your mind is what? Meningitis. And you know, the minute you suspect the patient has meningitis, you're putting that patient in isolation immediately. You're drawing labs and that patient is going on um, broad spectrum antibiotics until we figure out what the culture says and then they can get, you know, uh, a more specific antibiotics. But that patient that is only awake and alert to place and time only, what's going on with them? What is going on with this cognition? Remember, I told you priority patients, I gave you the list, and this is included. When there's a change of cognition, patients lethargic, they're um, irritable, they're agitated. That is an emergency. Something neurologically may be going on with that patient, including what? meningitis. That is the first patient you're going to see. Next, you're going to see the patient that has the glucose of 470. And I know what you're thinking, Professor D, 470, that's so high. Let me tell you something. Hypoglycemia will kill you much, much, much faster than hyperglycemia. When you have hyperglycemia, you start getting thirsty. You want to dilute all that sugar. You start getting hungry because your body's trying to get glucose from the food you're consuming because that glucose is um, um, uh, uh, stuck in the blood, right? You get uh, polydipsia. You have to go urinate all the time because your body's trying to get rid of all of um, that glucose in your body. There are so many compensatory mechanisms to buy you time when you're hyperglycemic. But when you're hypoglycemic, you're on the ground. So the reason, I mean, yes, we have to assess the patient who's hyperglycemic. I'm not saying they're not important, but when you're choosing between a patient that's hyperglycemic and the patient specifically an adolescent patient that has a fever and there's something going on with their cognition that's changed, that's the patient you're going to run to first. And like I said, you better be suspecting uh, meningitis, okay? So let's see how you guys did, but you guys did a great job.